Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name's George Youngson. I'm uh, one of the council members of Aberdeen Medical Chirurgical Society, and it's um, my role this afternoon to welcome you to the celebratory um, webinar uh, to commemorate the 250th anniversary of the birth of Sir James McGregor. Um, I really have to start with the acknowledgement of the sad news of his, the death of His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, um, who, as you know, is the longest serving consort in British history. Um, the Lord Lieutenant and Lord Provost, um, Mr. Barney Crockett, was to be opening the uh, webinar this afternoon, but in his role as Lord Lieutenant of the city, um, protocol mandates that he has to enter a period of mourning um, immediately. And so I've um, been asked just to uh, take over this introduction. And I, I do so, um, I'm very pleased to do so. Um, I, I hope you noticed that we've already had a wreath laying ceremony um, at the obelisk um, and, and more of that in a minute. But at the, the, the ceremony we had the Lord Provost um, and we also had Professor Alison Murray, who's the president of Aberdeen Medical Chirurgical Society, who is co-hosting um, the webinar along with the University of Aberdeen, the Army Medical Services, um, and indeed the city. Uh, and we also had Major Graham Wilson. Uh, Major Wilson is an ITU consultant in Aberdeen, and he's been particularly busy um, with the COVID pandemic treating patients um, uh, with the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which Aberdeen is the, the centre for in Scotland. So um, that was facilitated and aided, and aided by um, Katie um, Badham Thornhill. So thank you to those individuals for helping us commemorate the 9th of April. And the 9th of April will now be a memory for us all for uh, somewhat different reasons. It had been our intention um, when we started thinking about the need to commemorate this special date of the birth 250 years ago on this day of Sir James McGregor. It had been our plan to have a civic event um, and, and hence uh, the inclusion of, of the Lord Provost and others in this event. Uh, of course, the pandemic necessitated uh, a change to those plans. Um, and perhaps with the climate as has been in Aberdeen this week, that's been no bad thing. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I, I think it's been, it's been entirely appropriate to be present in preparation for this at the obelisk. Not everyone in Aberdeen appreciates that the obelisk um, in Duthie Park was uh, was built uh, from from granite to Alfred granite to to commemorate the contributions um, of Sir James McGregor, and it was moved from its original location in Marshall College in the quadrangle at Marshall College to Duthie Park in in 1906, and and is there as a permanent uh, reminder um, both. Um, of the, the contribution that Sir James made to the city, but also the university, to the armed forces, and to medicine in general, and to surgery in particular. So with, with those introductory remarks, it's my very pleasant uh, duty to hand you over to um, Professor Alison Murray, the format for this for this afternoon is that Alison will make her own welcome to you. We will then have four presentations, um, which I hope you've seen the program. Um, but in turn, Sir Jamie McGregor will talk about the family. 
um, Professor Jimmy Hutchison will talk about McGregor as a surgeon. Mr. Tom Scotland will talk about McGregor um, as a, a, a soldier and military history. And finally, um, Paul Logie will tell us about the writings uh, of Sir um, James McGregor and how they can be accessed in the university. We will then have a panel discussion and uh, we look forward to welcoming um, Brigadier Timothy Hodges to that discussion panel, who will deal with your questions and any, any other business that we feel has not been covered uh, in the introduction and in the um, different presentations. So with that, can I hand over um, and welcome Professor uh, Alison Murray, who is President of Aberdeen Medical Chirurgical Society. Thank you, George, for your introduction, which has been given at very short notice today because of, of ongoing events. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome everybody, but I would in particular like to welcome our special guests today. Um, so as you're aware, my, my name's Alison Murray. I'm, I'm president of the Medical Chirurgical Society in Aberdeen what we usually refer to as the med chi because it's easier to say. And um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our special guests to this commemorative event today to celebrate uh, the life and, and works of Sir James McGregor. I'm particularly pleased to welcome members of the McGregor family. Lady Mary McGregor, who is a, a celebrated historical author and um, Sir Jamie McGregor, who is the great, 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 great grandson of Sir James McGregor. And I'm aware that Lady Mary's daughter, Lorna, is also present uh, with us today. I'm delighted to welcome many members of the armed forces. And uh, Brigadier Timothy Hodgetts is with us as the head of uh, Army Medical Services. Brigadier Robin Simpson, um, who represents the veterans and is a veterans champion, Lieutenant Colonel Katie Badham Thornhill, who is the commanding officer at Aberdeen Officer Training Club. Um, uh, so welcome you all. And I know that the invitation, I'm grateful to Katie for having passed this on to relevant military circles. So friends of Millbank, many people have joined us from there. I'd also like to welcome our NHS representative, uh, Professor Linda Lynch, who is the chairperson of Grampian Health Board. And we are particularly aware of the efforts that the NHS have had to make over the, over the past year during the pandemic. So today we're celebrating, as you're aware, the 250th anniversary of the birth of Sir James McGregor, who was regarded as the father of army medicine. And we will hear from people who know much better than me of his enduring importance to the military, to the Medkai in Aberdeen and to the city of Aberdeen. Later, we will have the opportunity for questions following the speakers. And I would like to invite people to put their questions in the Q&A box throughout the, the presentations and we will pick them up at the end of the, of the presentations. Any time that we, we don't have uh, to answer all the questions, we will take forward on the event website. So I would like to introduce the first of our speakers, uh, Sir Jamie McGregor, as I've mentioned, um, a four times great grandson of Sir James, and also to welcome uh, his mother, Lady Mary McGregor, um, who edited um, the autobiography of Sir James McGregor from which I have learned a great deal recently. Uh, so, so Jamie, without further ado, I'd like to hand over for your presentation. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers uh, for including us uh, um, in this marvelous celebration and by saying, um, happy birthday to Sir James, and if I might take the liberty of doing so, to my daughter Sibylla, my eldest daughter, who is in the island of Bali, where she's been 
stuck for a year thanks to the pandemic. Um, Lord Provost, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a great privilege for me to do this. Um, Sir James's ancestors were very wild men of the hills. Um, the clan Gregor, uh, his, his branch of it, lived in Glen Lyon, um, and had been there since 1490. But unfortunately, the clan was outlawed in 1604. I won't go into the reasons for that. The chief was executed, and it became legal to shoot a McGregor and to brand their women with irons. But in 1624, the Earl of Murray bought some 300 McGregors um, to Strathspey, and Sir James's grandparents were known to have settled in Strath Arm near Tom and Tool at this time. Uh, the, the accounts of the Duke of Gordon's estate show a man, Grigor Grant, great grandfather of Sir James, as the taxman of a place called Delavora in 1708. His father, having moved to Cromdale, uh, got fed up with trying to make eco living from hill farming and started a business in Aberdeen making stocking hose for the Scottish regiments of the British Army. And he made enough money to send his son James to Aberdeen Grammar School, which was one of the finest schools in the country at that time, and included Lord Byron among its other pupils. I came across Sir James really through reading my mother's book, which was the edited autobiography of himself. And I got to see what a wonderful man he was and what a great sense of humour. And, and um, I, I did uh, enjoy reading it so much. And I'm excited that Tom Scotland is writing a new book. I can't wait to read it. I hear he's a great author, but from all accounts. In Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, he says, some are born with greatness, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. And I think while Sir James achieved greatness, he had it thrust upon him to a certain extent by winning the prize at um, his um, school. And I'd like to just read out from my mother's book it, what he says. Uh, this is his autobiography. I was educated at the grammar school Aberdeen, which had at that time a high reputation as one of the first of the public schools in Scotland. Dr. Dunn being the rector with able teachers for the five classes. At the conclusion of the five years course, there was an examination. And on that occasion, an event occurred, the most joyous to me, as I have often recounted, of any in my life. In the evening of the day, the whole of the pupils were assembled in the public hall in the presence of the Lord Provost, magistrates, professors of the university and the clergy of the city, and my name being called aloud by the rector, he announced to me in a Latin oration that the first prize had been awarded to me. He then presented me to the Lord Provost, who complimented me in a Scottish address. I left the public school amidst the applause of the assembly, from which I ran to my father's house at a quicker pace than ever I ran in my life to announce my success in having obtained the highest prize in the fifth or high class. And it has been my great good fortune to obtain various distinctions and honours, but with none of them have I been more elated than by the prize which I then gained when it was presented to me by the Lord Provost. My heart did not swell with more pride when nearly half a century left later, I was elected Lord Rector of my alma mater and of the University of Aberdeen. He, he achieved his medical uh, certificates in Edinburgh um, and, and then returned to Aberdeen where he and 11 others founded the famous, and the now famous, um, Medici, Medici, the, the Medico-Surgical Society. Uh, and they appeared to have had great fun doing that. He was very academic, young students. Uh, and they had all sorts of adventures, including, I think, digging up bodies. 
in order to perform experiments on them, which was all you could do in those days. But my mother would like to say um, some more about his humility and his humanity. And so I'll let her take over for a minute. The thing that strikes me most about Sir James Wilbur was his great love of humanity and his ability to make friends with people in all ranks of life from King George III down to the humblest soldiers. He really loved those soldiers and they loved him in return. When he had a fever in the Netherlands, they pushed him about in a wheelbarrow and when he got fever again, in Egypt, they carried him onto a ship. I just want to speak a little bit about his relationship with the Duke of Wellington, who he first met when he was Colonel Wesley, Wellesley rather, in, in India. Um, but and then Colonel Wellesley was ill, so he actually served under um, David Baird, General David Baird in India, who had all sorts of adventures. But to do, going back to Wellington, Wellington said of him, when he wanted to bring in somebody to take charge of medical affairs in the peninsula, send me the best. And he got Sir James McGregor. And later he was to say that McGregor was the most able public servant he had ever met. Um, but there were one or two rows too. And there was a marvelous moment when he arrived in Madrid to uh, report to Wellington on how things had gone in one of the campaigns. And um, he was getting on very well. Wellington at that point was having his portrait painted, sitting there having his portrait painted by none other than Goya, the Spanish artist. And um, he welcomed McGregor, was listening to him both happily, until he got to the point where he told Wellington that he was using some of the ammunition wagons to ferry wounded men back to hospital so he could patch them up. Whereupon Wellington got to his feet, the paints, Goya's paints went all over the place, and he shouted out, said, who is running this army, you or me? And anyway, later he relented, I think at some source, some source, some wisdom in McGregor's uh, um, ideas, and he had him to dinner that night anyway. Uh, but he was uh, he he was famous, obviously, for um, uh, for starting off the Royal Army Medical Corps in his later life. And but really, one of the most best things he did was to get people off the field of battle and patch them up. And Wellington again said that he wouldn't have won the Battle of Victoria had it not been for the efforts of McGregor in that respect. And I think I'll leave the rest to your other speakers. Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you very much, Sir Jamie. That was, that was excellent, um, very interesting. And, and yes, we do still have lots of fun in the Aberdeen Med Kai, although we no longer dig up bodies. Um, the sharp-eyed of you will notice that I omitted to mention my background, uh, which includes um, Dr. Mary Esselmont, who was one of, one of my predecessors, an extremely well-known doctor in, in Aberdeen and Scotland. Um, and it also includes a member of the McGregor family, Roddy McGregor, who was at that time Admiral of the Fleet. This, this photograph was taken 200 years ago uh, no, sorry, this was, photograph was taken at the 200th commemorative event of uh, the birth of Sir James McGregor. Anyway, moving on, the next uh, presentation is from Professor Jimmy Hutchison, who is um, uh, an orthopaedic surgeon and the uh, retired um, professor of surgery, the Regius Professor of Surgery at the University of Aberdeen. And he is going to tell us about Sir James McGregor's life as a surgeon. Thank you, Jimmy. Mr. James McGregor's journey to becoming a surgeon and the Army's top medical officer 
at the beginning of his medical studies. After leaving the grammar school as the star pupil, he entered Marshall College and enrolled for the degree of Atrium Magister, an MA which he took in his stride without really breaking sweat. So what next? His father wanted him to join the family business as a general merchant, but his mother could see his heart wasn't in it. Many of his friends had enrolled to study medicine, and out of curiosity, McGregor went with them to have a look at, Army, at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, which was at Woolman Hill. Anyway, McGregor was hooked. A stimulating career beckoned. And not just medicine, but possibly medicine in the army. Much has been made of his chance encounter with a senior student, a lad by the name of Farker, who had just enlisted and swapping his usual headgear for a smart army cocked hat complete with cocaine was strutting across the courtyard. That's got to be inspirational. Big magnet stuff. But it wasn't that straightforward. The professors of medicine in both of Aberdeen's universities didn't teach. In the absence of medical classes, those students wishing to become doctors usually became apprenticed to a qualified doctor in town. And McGregor came under the instruction of Dr. George French at the infirmary for the next three years. And he did well to last that long. Dr. French was said to have been of a cantankerous nature, a peppery and irascible gentleman inclined to grouse and fight with all and sundry. French was one of the two physicians at the infirmary, and they attempted to establish a course of lectures in medicine in 1786, but this was abandoned two years later. French only taught chemistry and sold patent medicines, and this left a big gap in McGregor's education. So for his teaching in anatomy, McGregor went to Edinburgh, walking all the way, taking a week. He attended the classes of Professor Alexander Munro, Munro Secundus, his father, Alexander Munro Primus, had been professor of anatomy at Edinburgh before him and was described as an easy, merry and cheerful man who lectured every Monday and took a rest on Tuesdays. Munro Secundus was an excellent lecturer who had a clearness of style that thrilled his audience like an electric shock. Munro Tertius, on the other hand, was a disappointment, but then he had a lot to live up to. Professor James Gregory was from Aberdeenshire and one of a remarkable dynasty of medical and academic Gregories. At the time of McGregor's studies, James Gregory was at the height of his powers and was popular and respected. McGregor worked hard in Edinburgh, too hard, and on his return to Aberdeen, he had to rest for several months before resuming his studies. At this time, he had been quite strongly influenced by the French Revolution, and he wrote in his autobiography, I brought the contagion of republicanism with me to Aberdeen. But his friends told him to calm down, and later his opinions changed completely when he joined the army. An important event happened while he was in Edinburgh. He had been elected to the Edinburgh Medical and Chirurgical Society, and this spurred him on to found the Aberdeen Medical Society. As has been said before, the medical teaching in Aberdeen was woefully inadequate, and McGregor, with 11 other students, took it upon themselves to form this self-help group. They took it seriously supplying books for communal Not use, still. having strict rules for their meetings. Absence at a meeting was fined sixpence, while the president had to cough up a halfpenny for every minute he was late. But there was a good deal of fun as might be expected. The birthday of the famous surgeon John Hunter was as good a reason as any, and the minutes record we proceeded to the tavern where we spent the greater part of the evening in mirth and jollity. So, Finished being a student and under the advice of his old master, Dr. George French, with whom he seems to have had a real and long lasting friendship, McGregor went to London to seek his fortune. George French had done this himself many years before, but had had to come back with his tail between his legs. McGregor met with a similar stony reception, but he eventually got apprenticed to an old single handed surgeon in the village of Islington, who seemed to devolve all his work onto his new assistant, so that didn't last long. France had declared war, and perhaps remembering the stylish figure cut by young Farquhar in his cocked hat, McGregor enlisted. His mother had died by this time, so her objection to James going abroad no longer held him back. But while he was in London, he famously wrote to his old friends in the Aberdeen Medical Society to urge them to expand their anatomical learning in the best and only way, by getting hold of freshly deceased corpses for dissection, by raiding graves at the dead of night to become resurrectionists. But that's a story for another time, best told in a graveyard at midnight. And so he followed the centuries-old path of the trainee surgeon, 
it was very common for young doctors at that time to cut their teeth in a military career with either Wellington's army or Nelson's navy. Indeed, out of the original 12 founders of the Medical Chirurgical Society, six went on to join the army. With the help of his father, he purchased a, purchased a surgency in the Irish Connacht Rangers. He would have cut a dash in his red coat with its yellow cuffs and collar, crimson sash round his waist and white sword belt over his shoulder. To crown it all, he wore one of the new shakos, the tall cylindrical cap with a peak and a plume. Sorry Prior to being that. posted to the wars, the regiment moved to the island of Jersey, where he encountered many French exiles fleeing the revolution with all their horror stories of the tumbro. Here he had to deal with his first outbreak of typhus, and he himself had a severe attack. And this characterised the work of the regimental surgeon in the 1790s. Short periods of frenzied chaos in battle interspersed with long and continual fight with disease. And it was disease that killed the troops much, much more than warfare. With soldiers cramped together in insanitary conditions, it was a nursery for disease. So much of MacGregor's work was in public health roles, and more of that later. It is arguably his greatest contribution to military success. In battle, he became a trauma surgeon, working under great pressure with large numbers of casualties and only rudimentary treatment options. No antiseptic or even aseptic operating, no anaesthetics or blood transfusions in those days. He slowly recovered from his bout of typhus and after pleading was allowed to join the regiment in embarking for Ostend. The sea air helped his recovery, although a fire on board beside the powder magazine gave rise to some excitement. On disembarking and settling in on the continent, a further outbreak of typhus recurred emphasising the toll on troops available to fight. And he started to become the surgeon, however basic the operations were. By repute, McGregor was a good surgeon. He had to be, and he would have had plenty of practice. And all the while under fire from the enemy. And McGregor describes cannonballs crashing through the walls of a church he had commandeered as a makeshift hospital, despite a hospital flag on the steeple. His requisitioning of the church had been against the pleading and tears of an old clergyman, and after this he wryly observed that mortality in the regiment greatly increased. In those days, there was little time for finesse, and in the field setting, one of the main operations for any severe limb injury was amputation. Because if left, the likelihood of life-threatening infection setting in was very high. Speed was important with the patient wide awake. Liston in the 1830s, his flaying knife would cut through flesh, then he sawed through the bone and inserted a few sutures. But he was good, and his mortality rate was only about one in six. Although once, in his zeal, he amputated not only the leg, but also the patient's testicles as well. This was the pattern with that war, and MacGregor's skills and reputation grew. Again, he was struck down with recurring bouts of typhus himself, and did well to survive by all accounts. After a short spell in England, the Connacht Rangers were posted to the West Indies, where MacGregor had more public health work to do. Malaria and yellow fever were rife. All this combined with some boys' own accounts of fighting the French. He became a lifelong and meticulous collector of data. He kept his hospitals clean and well ventilated. He recognised that prevention was key, as the treatments of the day were still primitive. He returned to Britain for a brief stay, and then the regiment was off to India, where three years later he was appointed as head of the medical staff for an expedition to Egypt, where disease again hit hard, this time the bubonic plague and blindness from Egyptian ophthalmia. By dint of his hard work, clinical ability, steadily increasing experience, and his friendly personality, his career and his reputation progressed, and he became a distinguished and well-respected army surgeon and officer. He was a natural leader. MacGregor felt strongly that when a soldier had made a compact with the state to fight its wars, the care of the soldier when sick or wounded should be as good as that provided for a private citizen, and the medical professionals looking after them should be equally as good. And he set about weeding out the impostors and inadequates and improving the general quality of the army medical staff. Despite his easygoing nature, MacGregor would not back down from a fight. And on return to Britain, he quarrelled with a London Army physician 
and nearly challenged him to a duel. It's a long story and worth reading, but suffice to say, it typified the disorder of the army medical services before Sir James McGregor's later transformations under the Duke of Wellington. In 1804, after 11 years with the Connaught Rangers, McGregor transferred to a guards regiment, the Blues. His new uniform made him laugh, a broad buff belt, jack boots that came high up my thigh, and stout leather gloves which reached nearly to my elbows with a large, fierce-looking cocked hat and a sword of great weight as, le- as well as length, just the dress for a morning's operator. And the following year, he became Deputy Inspector of Hospitals for the Northern District. He was climbing the ladder, now in posts that utilised his skills to their best. Soon he was transferred to the southwest and had to deal with the returning army from the calamitous Battle of Karuna, with, it, with disease rampant and hospital accommodation grossly inadequate. In 1809, the British troops landed on the island of Walcheren. Walcheren was a military disaster. 4,000 men died of disease, 106 fell in battle. All regiments were in hospital. MacGregor was sent for to replace the moribund inspector of hospitals who had fallen sick. And needless to say, he rose to the task. But all he could really do was to organise the evacuation. It was a disaster, but it did one good thing. It showed that the medical board that was in charge of the Army Medical Services, with its physician general, surgeon general, and inspector of regimental hospitals, all of whom had no knowledge or experience of military medicine or surgery, was riven by infighting and ignorance and was not fit to continue. Change was in the air. And that really brings me to the end of my episode, and I'll hand back to Professor Murray to introduce the real expert. And I should say before I go that all I know about James McGregor comes from three sources. The late Alec Adam, who was such a fount of knowledge, and from two great books. The first by Mary McGregor, the great man's direct descendant, based around Sir James' own autobiographical writings. And the second, shortly to be published by our next speaker, Tom Scotland. And it is a wonderful and very readable account of the great man's adventurous life put into the perspective of medicine of his age and army medicine through the ages. Margaret Farker, Barney's predecessor from 25 years ago, used to say that if you copy stuff from one source, it's plagiarism. If you copy from multiple sources, it's research. So I think I've got a way with it. Thanks. You're on mute, Alison. Thank you for telling me. Sorry. I, apologies. I'd just like to, to thank Jimmy very much for that presentation, uh, bringing uh, Sir James's work as a surgeon to life and um, how much things have, have changed today. I now like to move on to introduce uh, Tom Scotland. Tom is is a a very respected military historian. He was previously a consultant orthopaedic surgeon in Aberdeen, and I remember him very well in that role uh, and will have done radiological examinations for his patients. Tom is going to present us the the life of Sir James McGregor as a soldier. Tom, thank you. The title of my presentation is James McGregor, Head of Medical Services in the Peninsula, 1812 to 1814. In April 1809, Sir Arthur Wellesley was given command of an Anglo-Portuguese army. He replaced Sir John Moore, who'd been killed at the Battle of Corona in January 1809. Wellesley was made Viscount Wellington after the Battle of Talavera in July of that year. He consistently beat the French in battle, but increasing numbers of his soldiers fell victim to disease. Napoleon Bonaparte himself said, the English cannot hold the peninsula, half their army is on the sick list. Why did the British have a higher sickness rate than the French? Well, many were suffering from chronic ill health from the outset. This predisposed them to disease. They were veterans of a previous campaign, an island of Walcheren 
now part of a reclaimed landmass of the Netherlands. Between July and December 1809, thousands of British soldiers died or became chronically sick from vulture and fever, a lethal cocktail of typhus, typhoid, malaria, and dysentery. Many soldiers in the peninsula were raw recruits, often in poor health, not acclimatized. They too fell victim to disease. Wellington had a single army of operation. The French had armies of occupation. It has been argued that Wellington's coalition army was busier than any single French army. Wellington consistently beat the French and dealt with many French sick and wounded prisoners. These French sick and wounded prisoners often did not appear on French returns. But Wellington became increasingly anxious regarding his heavy losses. And on the 3rd of October, 1811, he sent a dispatch requesting that the best medical officer be sent out to the peninsula. The Duke of York had no hesitation whatsoever in sending out James McGregor. McGregor immediately redeployed medical officers who were enjoying themselves in Lisbon, sent them to the front and reorganized the apothecary and purveyor departments. He segregated the sick from the wounded. He established convalescent hospitals. General hospitals became cleaner, better ventilated, and reduced overcrowding. He improved soldiers' accommodation. He improved their nutrition. Furthermore, he collected data concerning every aspect of a soldier's health. He believed that a soldier's personal environment was the key to prevention of disease, and he needed the close cooperation working relationship with Wellington. He wrote, a good commanding officer has in general a healthy regiment. Everything can be done in the prevention of disease, but unfortunately very little in the treatment when it supervenes. A treatment such as it was, early intervention was essential, and he wrote, in acute disease, everything depends on active treatment being pursued at the very commencement. McGregor's aim was to expand the regimental hospital system closer to the front, thereby treating soldiers earlier. Wellington sanctioned most of McGregor's proposals to improve the health of the army, but he would not allow the use of good transport to take sick and wounded soldiers to regimental hospitals. Men instead were transported on unsprung bullet carts to distant general hospitals. This was McGregor's worst nightmare. It meant that sick and wounded soldiers endured energy-sapping journeys, and they often arrived moribund at general hospitals in Portugal. McGregor was very envious of the French system of evacuation because the French had sprung wagons of Larry's Ambulance for Long or Flying Ambulance. Larry developed Ambulance for Long in 1797. It consisted of three divisions, each with 113 men, and each division had 12 light and four heavy sprung wagons. McGregor had first met Larry in Egypt in 1801, following the French surrender of Alexandria. At the time, Larry was surgeon in chief to the Army of the Orient. The two men would keep in touch thereafter. Indeed, they would become friends. And Larry was made an honorary member the Aberdeen Medical Chirurgical Society in 1817. After the Battle of Salamanca on the 22nd of July, 1812, Wellington was sitting for a portrait by Goya in Madrid when his chief medical officer entered the room. McGregor reported that he'd used good transport wagons to evacuate the wounded after the battle. Wellington flew into a rage. I shall be glad to know who is to command this army, I or you. I establish one route, one line of communication. You establish another and order the commissariat and the supplies by that line. As long as you live, sir, never do so again. Never do anything without my orders. But McGregor stood his ground. There was no time to consult your lordship without loss of life. Wellington's anger soon subsided because McGregor had Wellington's complete confidence. In September and October 1812, Wellington was laying siege to Burgos. Things were not going well, and French armies were closing in. His supply lines were too long. McGregor was with Wellington when Wellington decided he must retreat to Portugal. 
I must leave this place this very night. But what is to become of our sick and wounded, he asked. I was happy to inform him that I got all the carts and mules that came up with provision for the army, and by them on their return had daily sent back every one that could be moved to the hospitals which I had established. Well, I quickly rejoined, admirable, I shall be off tonight. Make your own arrangements quickly and quietly. And so began the terrible retreat from Burgos into Portugal, a long and difficult withdrawal with French in hot pursuit. Wellington's army was sick and demoralized and there was an outbreak of typhus fever. Wellington despaired of ever being able to wage war against the French again, but MacGregor transformed the health of the army over the winter 1812 to 13. This graph shows hospital admissions expressed as a percentage of ration strength from January 1812 through to June 1813. And you will see it around the time of the siege of Burgos, 35 to 37 percent of the regimental strength was in hospital sick. Over the winter months during convalescence, that percentage gradually, progressively declined until by June 1813, only 16.2 percent of regimental strength was in hospital, a marked improvement. But how did MacGregor achieve this? Most importantly, he persuaded Wellington to make full use of the regimental hospitals, increasing their total capacity from 2,000 to 5,000. Fewer severely seriously sick were evacuated on these terrible unsprung bullet carts. He wrote, in a short time, the march of sick to the established hospitals in the rear was stopped and it was high. Sent to the rear was great. Early treatment, with supportive measures in regimental hospitals, improved the prognosis who were seriously sick and less severely affected individuals were able to return to duty more quickly. McGregor made 4,000 to 5,000 soldiers available for fighting, and fight they did at the Battle of Victoria on the 21st of June 1813, an overwhelming victory for Wellington. He wrote in his autobiography, it was said with much truth by an eminent individual that he thought the extraordinary exertions of the medical officers of the army might be said to have decided the day at Victoria, for their exertions had undoubtedly added a full division and strength to Lord Wellington's army, and without those 4,000 or 5,000 men, it is more than doubtful if his lordship, with all his unrivaled talents, could have carried the day. Wellington regarded return to duty as MacGregor's greatest strength. A.J. Butler, historian, and the official history of Australian Army Medical Services 1914 to 18 on the Western Front, wrote in 1940, James MacGregor was a master of return to duty with whose help in the Peninsular War, Wellington brought the organization and working of the medical service to a pitch of perfection till then unapproached in any European army. Butler compared MacGregor's talents with those of Larry and Major General Sir Neville Howes, Director General of Australian Army Medical Services. It may be doubted whether since Baron Larry directed medical affairs for Napoleon, and Sir James McGregor for Wellington, any head of a medical service has gained so completely the confidence of the military command or exercised so great a personal influence in military affairs as did Surgeon General Howes within the scope of the Australian Imperial Force. Howes had been the first Australian recipient of the Victoria Cross in 1900 during the Second Boer War. He, like McGregor, was an inspirational figure who always put the need of the common soldier first. He had the complete confidence of Lieutenant General Sir John Monash, commanding officer of the Australian Corps, just as McGregor had the complete confidence of Wellington. He transformed the fortunes of the Australian Corps following the German Spring Offensive of March 1918. He reduced heavy losses from sickness and he delivered early treatment of wounded by field ambulance resuscitation teams in the subsequent rapid advance to victory in which the Australians played a major role. 
McGregor wrote, cases are numerous, but in the lives of officers and soldiers have been saved by zealous medical officers being at hand to suppress hemorrhage. It is no small advantage of the surgeon at hand to extract cloth and splinters. Circumstances may subsequently prevent this being done till a long period afterwards, when the state of inflammation has been considerably advanced and when their extraction must be attended with infinitely more pain, whereas by promptness, life or limb might have been saved, especially the former, as at an early period, amputation would have been successful. James McGregor had the most incredible insight, and surely he was the father of British Army Medical Services. I have unmuted myself this time. Thank you very much, Tom. That was very interesting, fascinating account. I should now like to introduce Paul Logie from the Museums and Special Collections at the University of Aberdeen, who is going to tell us about the archive McGregor documents and how you can obtain access to these. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Logie and I'm an archives assistant in Museums and Special Collections at the University of Aberdeen. I'm going to talk today about the papers of Sir James McGregor held by the Aberdeen Medical Chirurgical Society. I was the project archivist responsible for cataloguing the papers as part of a year long project, which began in November 2008. This was the result of a successful joint funding bid to the Wellcome Trust by the Society and the University of Aberdeen an arrangement which has helped foster a good working relationship between both parties and had lasting benefits in terms of providing access to the collections and ensuring the long term care of the society's archive and promotion of the material. It also means that although the online catalogue to the McGregor papers and the wider archives of the society is hosted by the University of Aberdeen and administered by museums and special collections, the archive itself is still retained by the society and they manage access to the collection. The main goals of this project were firstly to create a detailed catalogue of the archive of the society and to make this available to search online for the first time via the CAM database, which is the software used by museums and special collections to catalogue its archive and museum collections. The collections were also promoted to the wider history of medicine community via leaflets, archive mailing lists, talks and displays in an effort to encourage researchers to make greater use of the collections. And a paper conservator produced a conservation report highlighting the overall condition of the archives and made recommendations for their storage and any future conservation work required. The papers of Sir James McGregor alongside the minutes dating from the formation of the society are the real stars of the collection and in view of their importance were catalogued first. His papers had previously been digitised by university staff in around 2007 and a further goal of the project was to link the catalogue entries on CAM to the relevant digital copies of the material using a software package called Digito some examples of these digitised pages are shown in the next few slides. As you can see from this screenshot from the catalogue, his papers were arranged into five sections, beginning with the list of manuscripts donated by McGregor, followed by his letter books, journals and case books. The final section consists of various records kept by McGregor throughout his career, such as results of experiments, dissection reports and, admis and, ad and admission books. The first item in the McGregor series of papers, a volume containing the list of manuscripts donated by him to the Society in 1847, includes a covering letter expressing his wish that they benefit the junior members of the Society as an example, and I quote, of the 
persevering industry with which I prosecuted my profession from my first entrance into the army and to which I mainly attribute my success in it. The next section contains 10 letter books dating from 1805 to 1815 and cover the period when McGregor was Deputy Inspector of Hospitals, Inspector General of Hospitals and Chief of the Medical Staff of the Peninsular Army. What is very apparent from his letters is the sheer volume of, of administrative work involved in overseeing the health of the troops and making sure adequate medical supplies were available for hospitals under his charge. It's also clear that he kept a close eye on his staff and praised their conduct when he felt necessary, as well as being very precise about the level of information he expected from them in their, in their reports. The later volumes of his letter books include copies of his correspondence to the Army Medical Board, his staff and to Wellington when he was chief of the medical staff of the Peninsular Army. They can be consulted alongside McGregor's 13 volumes of journals, which comprise Section 3. These again offer an important insight into the events of the Peninsular War in 1812 and 1813, after he was appointed Chief of the Medical Staff in late 1811. They record his activities after his arrival in Lisbon in January 1812, and his observations on the conditions in the various hospitals and the extent of the medical facilities available. The journals also offer an insight into the various illnesses suffered by the troops and include his notes on the reports received from the various hospital stations. Journal 1 also, record, also records his first meeting with Wellington in February 1812 and the recommendations he was keen to suggest to improve medical facilities for the army, one of the most important being how sick and wounded men were transported. McGregor's collection of 28 case books comprise Section 4 and cover the period 1796 to 1805, when he was surgeon in the 88th Regiment. These notes record the daily progress and treatment of each patient admitted to the regimental hospital while stationed in England, Egypt, India and Jersey. The case books are not always in McGregor's handwriting and the entries were sometimes written by his assistants. The final section, Related Papers, is a collection of single items that didn't fit easily into a recognisable series. Dating from 1796 to 1814, they include post-mortem reports, a register of the weather, and a record of the diseases which prevailed among the British troops in the peninsula in 1812-14. The image you see on the slide is taken from one of the most significant items within this section, a volume containing the results of trials relating to the treatment of dysentery in 1799, a source which provides a detailed record of McGregor's attempts to cure what was a serious and uh, common illness among the troops at that time. With regard to finding out more about the collections, inquiries and requests to view the material can be sent to the medchai.admin address shown on the screen. To consult the catalogue of the Society, including the McGregor papers, please go to the university web address shown on the screen. The reference number for the collection is AMCS, and inputting this into the search box will take you to the online catalogue for the MedChai papers. To view the digitised copies of McGregor's papers, please go to the collections pages on the library website and click on the digital collections tab. I hope this presentation has helped to highlight the value and extent of the McGregor papers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. That's that's very important information for people who are interested in this to, to be aware of. Um, I'd like, like, now like to invite back uh, speakers and to welcome Brigadier Timothy Hodgetts as head of the Army Medical Services uh, to join our panel and we're we're happy to take uh, questions entered into the Q&A um, box by clicking on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So we will have back um, Sir Jamie McGregor, uh, Lady Mary McGregor, Professor Jimmy Hutchison, who's here already I see, and Mr Tom Scotland.
Great. I'd, I'd like to start the questioning off, if I might, by asking Tim, uh, what, what he thinks the contemporary legacy for the common soldier today is from the uh, life and works of Sir James McGregor? Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and for that, that great question to, uh, to start off the panel. I mean, it's quite difficult to do Sir James's legacy justice in, in just a few words. Um, we've certainly heard much in the history that resonates in today's Army Medical Services. But if I can just identify a few highlights of, uh, of, of that legacy. He set up the first proper depot hospital for the Army Medical Services at Chatham in 1819. And that was superseded by the Cambridge Military Hospital, built in 1879. And that survived over 100 years into the late 1990s to our contemporary model of integrating hospital units into the NHS. So if you're sick or injured on operations today, you actually come back to an NHS hospital in Birmingham. He introduced uh, standards and merit to medical officer recruiting, and that tradition is still upheld and is fiercely competitive today uh, to obtain the really sought after medical bursaries as a medical student. He started benevolence funds for the Army Medical Services and their families, and the RAMC uh, still give up uh, one day's pay per year to sustain that benevolence. He introduced a library and museum to aid core spirit in education. Uh, and that's morphed into the Defence Medical Library, which is up at Whittington Barracks, where we have our Defence Medical Academy. And there's a, a museum at Keogh Barracks in Aldershot, which will become a, a new military medical museum in Cardiff, hopefully in the near future. I think really importantly, he set in place proper data recording uh, of events and disease. And that mentality has been increasingly important on contemporary operations, improving the impact of our interventions to develop an evidence-based approach to military medicine and to drive continuous quality improvement. But if I can just focus on the, the clinical legacy, because it really is substantial and, and highlight two enduring precepts. The first is to establish that care on military operations should be as good as care at home. I think that's something that we'd perhaps forgotten late in the uh, 20th century, uh, but we were able to relearn early in the 21st century. Uh, and that led to us having not as good uh, outcomes, but better outcomes than our civilian uh, counterparts, particularly in relation to serious injury. And then that precept of treating as far forward as possible remains a principle that's led to uh, further contemporary disruptive outcomes uh, by giving soldiers the knowledge and the equipment to treat themselves, to treat their buddies in the first few minutes, particularly to stem life-threatening bleeding. That's led to outcomes that have never before uh, been experienced. But it's that same precept uh, that McGregor uh, started off with. And if I can just finish by uh, uh, reminding people that there is a statue of Sir James uh, by the Staff College at gate entrance to the Royal Mid Military Academy Sandhurst, uh, and it overlooks Robertson House, the current home of the Army Medical Services. So he is still keeping a watchful eye over us 250 years later. The inscription on the back of that uh, statue is one that uh, Sir Jamie has already referred to, taken from one of Wellington's dispatches in 1814, uh, where he uh, cites Sir James as being one of the most industrious and successful public servants I've ever met with. And I can't think of a much higher commendation than that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. That's great. I'm going to move on to the questions uh, posed in the Q&A panel, but, and we can come back to some further questions. There's one from Beverly Bergman. Is there any information as to whether Dr. Alexander McGregor, medical superintendent at Scutari during the Crimean War, was akin to Sir James? Does anybody know Tom? Are you aware of that? No? A lot of head shaking going on here. Sorry about that. Um, then Mick Crumpin, Crumplin. Of the great triumvirate of Sir John Pringle, John Hunter and Sir James McGregor, does the panel feel that it was McGregor that really militarised surgery? Who would like to answer that? Uh, I think you're muted, Tom. 
Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> That's all this technology. You're, you're not the first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so John Pringle was certainly uh, regarded as one of the originators of military medicine and hygiene. Uh, he also had to be a professor of moral philosophy at the University of Edinburgh and part time a military surgeon. But McGregor was a full time military surgeon and put Pringle's ideas into practice. As for John Hunter, he certainly was a prominent surgeon and he was the regarded as, as the authority at the beginning of the 19th century. But his ideas of military surgery were superseded not by James McGregor, but rather by George James Guthrie, who put forward the ideas of early surgery for treatment of the wounded. You see, John Hunter uh, was very much of the opinion that soldiers should be left until inflammation had taken place and was over before soldiers were subjected to surgery. Uh, so I would say that, that Sir James McGregor was certainly the military medical man, uh, more so than, than uh, Sir John Pringle, uh, but really as far as surgery was concerned, uh, Guthrie was the man to look for there. Okay, thank you, Tom. The next question is from Jane Orr, and she asks, I believe that one of the most important things that McGregor recognised in the peninsula was the importance of salt in the soldier's diet. Who would like to answer that one? <laughs> he, well, he, he, he certainly improved the nutrition greatly. And one of the most important things he did over the winter of 1812, 1813, was to improve uh, the diet of soldiers, including salt, and, and uh, their accommodation. That's great. And that contributed to uh, more soldiers recovering, able to fight at Vittoria in June 1814. 18, 1813, I beg your pardon. Um, and then a question from, it's a rather cryptic name, Alank000. Uh, was there any understanding at this time of the infective nature of conditions such as typhus and dysentery? Important question because infection seems to be what killed more people than, than battle. I'll answer it if you like, but some of the others might want to do it. Any other takers? No? Carry on, Tom. The important thing is that four, four times as many people died from infection has died from uh, wounds. And the causes of uh, infections were usually put down to uh, dramatic changes in humidity, dramatic changes in temperature, and bad smells, the miasmata coming from marshy ground and bogs. The problem was that nobody knew the causative organisms. It would be a hundred years before bacteria and viruses and parasites were discovered. So they were missing that vital link. And consequently, diseases were attributed to these other factors. And it's no surprise therefore that treatments were useless to say the best, for the most part. Some treatments were okay but they didn't know what the causative organisms were. Typhus retained its original name when they discovered the typhus organism many years later. Other fevers were really classified according to the type of fever it was, a continued fever or an intermittent fever. They didn't know what the organisms were. Okay, thank you. Um the next question is from Matthew Lee and is, is for Jimmy Hutchison. Prof Hutchison touched on McGregor's role in the Caribbean, including his service with the 88th Regiment. The 88th was sent to Grenada to subdue a rebellion of enslaved and free people of colour in Grenada. 
1795 to 96, as detailed in McGregor's autobiography. Do the panelists have any further thoughts on various role in these places and the relationship between colonialism and the production of medical knowledge? Oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> a hard one. I, I could answer it very quickly. Uh, no, I, I don't really. But I did find it absolutely fascinating uh, reading Mary's book uh, uh, based on uh, the great man's own papers about his time in the West Indies and the origins of that slave revolt and how it, it panned out. And it was clear that Sir James felt that more could have been done for the population if it had been approached differently. It was, a, it was obviously a, a nasty, a dirty war in the West Indies. Uh, Tom mentioned about the, the infectious diseases there, and McGregor recognised that the, the, the treatments were very primitive, and his, his, his best hope lay in prevention. And he writes then about the dangers of swampy ground and very hot uh, weather. Um, he kept his hospitals fresh, clean, well ventilated to try and cut down this, this contagion. But the, the, the actual integration of the, the, the population and how it worked out between the French, uh, it was a nasty, difficult war. And I think from reading his, his autobiography, he was very glad to be on the ship home. He was very lucky to be on the ship home. He was very lucky. <laughs> Aye, you're right. Um, a quick comment from Nick Crumplin about salted rations um, contributing to salt depletion in hot climate, climates. Um, and then I'm going to take one final question from David Knight, and then we're going to um, move on with the, with the next uh, stage of the presentation. So David Knight, I don't know if this is David Knight, the orthopaedic surgeon in Aberdeen. Uh, so John Pringle, John Hunter and James McGregor were all Scottish. Was that chance or were there circumstances that pushed them into the army and medical involvement? Most, um, most. Tom will know much more no, about No, no, carry on, Jimmy. Um, but it is true that an awful lot of young Scots doctors went into the, the military forces and they went in as surgeons, uh, people who actually got on and did things, whereas a lot of the, the, particularly the London medical graduates, if they were affiliated to the army, it would have been as army physicians who actually had very little to do with the care of the, the, the soldier, either uh, their care in barracks uh, from sickness or their care on the battlefield. So uh, I do think that, the, the, and it's interesting that McGregor, when he joined the army, specifically avoided signing up to a Scottish regiment because it was already stap it full of young Scottish doctors who were ambitious to make their own name. So he went for the Connaught Rangers, the Irish regiment. But Tom will know more than I do. Well, not, not really, Jimmy. The other th important thing was that uh, the Scots were better educated. There were five universities in Scotland, two in Aberdeen, one in St Andrews, one in Edinburgh, one in Glasgow, and only two in England at Oxford and Cambridge. And the vast majority of doctors in the British Army were, were Scots. And, and the majority of, of fellowships and subsequent memberships and MD theses were Scots. Uh, and and uh, this didn't change really until uh, 1817, I think it was, when University College London opened its medical school. And, um, and um, that, I think, is one of the reasons why there were so many Scots in the army. Thank you. Um, I was going to bring Sir Jamie McGregor back in at that point, but I think his connection has gone. So we're, we're going to carry on with questions meantime. Um, one from Mark Hamilton. 
To what extent were McGregor's clinical innovations in the overseas campaign supported by nursing personnel, uh, locally recruited or as part of the army medical staff in those days? Is anybody aware? <laughs> um, no. Uh, Tim, what about Mick Crumplin? Has he got any idea? Uh, gone from the from the. He's field. gone. I'm afraid um, I can't shed any light on that. No. Okay. A question for an anonymous attendee: Do we have any comparable characters today? Are we too specialised? Well, I think we'd be too humble to answer that one. <laughs> I think medicine has increased in complexity. Okay, um, Sir Jamie, can you hear me? There's a blank on the screen. Okay, um, well, my, my next role then is to, is to ask, oh, no, sorry, I thought she was coming in. Um, to ask Professor Richard Wells to give some concluding remarks uh, to our, our webinar this afternoon. Uh, Richard, thank you. Thank you, Alison. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a real honour for me to represent the principal and the university this afternoon. Despite having been at the university for uh, over 20 years, I knew little of McGregor until recently, but I've learned so much both this afternoon uh, and in my readings um, about him in recent days of the service and exceptional life of this amazing individual, I genuinely feel humbled to have done so. Since 1495, the university has strived to follow its foundational purpose, to be open to all and dedicated to the pursuit of truth in the service of others. Few individuals could surely have served others with such dedication as Sir James McGregor. His army service was exceptional, but so too was his service to his alma mater, serving as rector to Marshall College in 1826, 1827 and 1841. This being a substantive role in the Scottish ancient universities, as with it goes the position of chair of the university court. So I'd like to thank all the people who've been involved in today's uh, presentations, but particularly George Youngson, Alison Murray, Sir Jamie and Lady Mary McGregor, Jimmy Hutchison, Tom Scotland, Paul Logie, Brigadier Tim Hodgetts and other colleagues from the Army and Army Medical Services. As ever, the organizers of the event who've put so much work into getting everything together, Marilyn Walker, Jen Shaw, and Lynn Grant, and also, of course, particularly in these days, the IT team at the University of Aberdeen, and in particular, Bruce Beatty for his work, keeping us all out to schedule and doing the right things this afternoon, and reminding us when we need to turn our mute buttons off. So, to conclude, thank you all for a wonderful afternoon, remembering the life of an incredible individual. And thank you to all of you who have joined us in the audience too. We hope you've enjoyed it and perhaps something learned something new about Sir James McGregor. It was particularly wonderful to see his family present here today. And I hope you feel we have done his memory justice. So thank you all very much for joining us and I hope you've enjoyed this event.